Drugs, guns, abuse, violence, prison. The young couple you're about to meet each have dramatic stories of transformation in their lives, and they love to tell about it. Meet John and Brandy Jonathan. Welcome to 100 Huntley Street. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. We are thrilled to have you because we have been reading about your stories and they are really mm. uh, riveting. As parents of young people, mm. you know, what you have lived through really do, it, mm. it's sobering for parents to think about. And I, I uh, met you, John, here at the mm -hmm. Crossroads Center. You, you were in the uh, uh, studio audience for a, a program and, and right after I, uh, I met you and just in the hallway, you were telling me a little bit of your story and I thought, you know what? You, you guys need to come on 100 Huntley Street and share that. So let's, uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, John, well, because you both have tremendous stories, so we're going to have to do a little ping pong yeah. back and forth here a bit. But John, um, take us back to, to your early days, your, your childhood, and kind of what led you into the direction that you were going. Well, I was born in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my parents were divorced when I was very young. So I'd visit my dad, but he wasn't really around a lot, you know, maybe a couple times a month or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but my older brother, you know, I really wanted to be like him because everyone just, everyone kind of gravitated towards him. People loved him. Mm -hmm. He was, he was popular. He was t tough. Girls yeah. liked him, you know, so I, I just wanted to be like him, right? Uh, but he started getting into drugs when he was younger too. It kind of was just a natural progression for me to, to roll right into that myself. And, and so before how old were you when you first got into drugs? How old were you? Well, I was probably only about 12 when I, when I first smoked pot. Uh, but at 14, I started using every day. Every day? Every day. Wow. Uh, at school, uh, when I got home, friends, uh, we lived in a, uh, like a, a townhouse complex and other kids in the neighborhood were using, so we'd all just kind of hang out together and get high. Mm -hmm. And that really started you down a path that, that you had no idea where mm -hmm. it would lead ultimately, but it led you into some pretty dark stuff. Well, yeah. Usually people, when you're younger, you talk about, uh, you make fun of people who talk about how pot's just a gateway drug. But for me, that was definitely the case. Before you knew it, I was, I was completely out of control. By the time I was 17, I was using cocaine every day too trying to sell it to make money to support my pot habit, which ended up backfiring because that got me into the cocaine. Mm -hmm. So it was, I, my life just spun right out of control. I was, I was using drugs in the house and my mom was, well, increasingly angry at me. She would threaten to kick me out all the time. Mm -hmm. And you even were growing some drugs. Yeah, I was uh, off, offered an opportunity to start growing pot uh, from people that I had I had dealt with uh, just just selling pot and because I really had no aspirations for life I had no purpose or drive it was like a perfect job because I just sit there with a gun and and grow drugs and then then I'll get paid and and be able to do more drugs mm -hmm. sit there with a gun now the, you because you had to protect what you were yeah. doing because you were running with some pretty rough characters by this time yeah uh, it's a natural progression. As you get into harder drugs, you start dealing with, with people who are, are harder themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So the people I were, I were hanging out with were, were pretty serious cats. Um, but I wanted to be pretty serious myself. A lot of, a lot of what I did was just motivated out of fear. Mm -hmm. You know, fear of, of people, fear of what, what people thought of me. You know, fear that they might try to hurt me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to portray that I, I'm really tough and, you know, watch out for me. And What was really happening on the inside, though? You had this tough exterior. What, what was going on in, inside? Mm -hmm. Well, inside, I, you know, I didn't actually feel all that tough unless I was really high or drunk. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I knew I wasn't really that tough at all, you know, but I, I could play a good game, I guess. Was there ever a time where you even felt like uh, turning that gun maybe on yourself. I remember, I remember at one point I was living in a house that uh, the bathroom was all tore apart and uh, half the walls were ripped down inside and, and I had no money, no food. I had been living on Mr. Noodles and Portuguese buns for about, I don't know, a week or two. And I remember one night, it must have been about midnight, I sat there and I had this little 22 
Uh, I used to call it the pirate gun. And my life sucked so bad, I just, I sat there and I loaded it up and, and I looked at it for a while and, and I thought, you know, I should just do this. There really is no purpose for me. And it was like, it was almost like I heard God in that moment saying, you know, there's a, there's a reason why you're going through what you're going through. You know, there's, there's something's going to come out of this. And I just felt an urge to, to write down all the things I was thankful for. And so I had a, an empty pack of cigarettes and I wrote it on the, on the back of that. Mm. And they were really outlandish things like, you know, I think I wrote down that I was thankful for the gun and, <laughs> um, you know, for the Mr. Noodles. And I didn't end up doing it that night. And, you know, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. What an amazing change of thought, though. You know, mm -hmm. from the thought of, I should really use this gun on myself, to, I should write down what I'm thankful for. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. That was a God moment, even though you hadn't yet come to that place yeah. in your life where you said, God, I need you, I surrender to you. God was still there saying, mm -hmm. oh, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you do that, John. Let's turn your thoughts away from that mm -hmm. to thankfulness, really. You know, there, I'm sure there are so many God moments mm -hmm. in your story. As Brandy, I'm yeah. sure there's lots oh, yeah. of God moments in yeah. your story. Tell us about Definitely. your early life. Well, growing up, we would go to church at Christmas. And, you know, I just remember that was, you know, the one time event of the year. And um, I grew up in a wonderful home, mother, father, two older brothers. And, um, but I remember always being petrified of death and eternity. I remember nights when I was you know, seven and laying in bed, just sobbing. Mm -hmm. And I would just remember thinking, wondering what eternity was like and thinking, how can I cease to exist? And I just didn't get it. And yeah, there would be, that happened for years and I would cry and cry and I never told anyone about it. I just kind of kept it to myself. And I think from that and the fear of the unknown, I kind of spiraled into um, just destruction. You know, it started in high school, um, you know, getting high and um, became very promiscuous. I was searching for something. So, you know, to, to go to a party and just get extremely drunk and just lose control because I was so insecure and I'd always struggled with my weight and I always wanted to, to make myself just feel better. So I searched for ways to do that. So I just reached out for anything to make me feel better. And, and uh, you know, I always felt that void and tried to fill it myself and just I got into some pretty horrible situations just with drugs and alcohol and, and needing it constantly because I didn't feel safe and secure in myself. So, mm -hmm. so let's, uh, let's jump back then. As I said, we're doing a little ping pong interviewing here. But John, we left you at the point where you were you know, contemplating suicide. You thought, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a little while later, though, you, you got into a situation where it was even a, a gun battle. What, what led up to that and then uh, your eventual incarceration? Well, I was at a, a rock quarry swimming um, to get away actually from my associates that day just to kind of relax and they ended up coming up uh, just through coincidence without getting too far into it. Just someone was stabbed uh, by my associates. And associates I, meaning the, the people that you did drugs with, that you ran yeah, with, that yeah. sold and bought and, yeah. And I put the guy into a car, which ended up saving his life. He was pretty hurt. The guy that was stabbed. Yeah. You wanted to save his life. Yeah. I, you know, God was really, he was, he was pulling at my heart in ways that, you know, at the time when you're looking at it, you don't think much of it, but there's definitely something going on there. Um, and... My associates really did not like that much and had said some rude stuff to me about it. And I thought, you know, why not rip them off? Get back at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll leave Hamilton and I'll, I'll take a bunch of money and, you know, it, it'll also show them how, how cool and tough I am and how I'm not afraid of them. So I did that and being the drug addict that I was, the, the money was gone pretty darn quick, you know. Mm -hmm. I was... I was broke pretty quick. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so I never actually left. I ended up staying around Hamilton and, and they found out where I was and I had heard that they were gonna, they were gonna try to kill me. So I thought one night uh, as I had been drinking, thought that maybe I'd go scare them. Maybe they'd leave me alone. 
So I uh, went up to where I knew they were having a party and, and knocked at the front door. And uh, a guy came and looked out and, you know, yelled, it's, it's me, and turned around and ran. And I just put my gun up to the door and I shot right into the house.